Good evening to all our viewers watching us from wherever you are. It's a pleasure to have you join us on today's show where we discuss about a rather interesting topic or a controversial one depending on what you, whether you ascribe to it or not, and that is none other than the issue of labia elongation and its reflection on girls and women's rights. Now to uh, just shed a bit more light about it for those that might be following us and they're not very familiar with the topic, labia elongation, also known as um, labia stretching, is the act of elongating the labia minora through manipulation, and of course as suggested by its name. It's also a known cultural practice in some African countries, including Rwanda, Uganda, Malawi, Zambia, and so many more. So to reflect on whether this is harmful or not, I'm joined today by Ms. Juliette Caritani, the Director of Communications at HDI, as well as a women's rights activist, and Dr. Magnifique Irakoze, a gynecologist. It's great to have you both on the show. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yes. Well, to start us off, I would like to get both your views about uh, what exactly this practice in Rwanda is and the current situation, starting off with you, Dr. Magnifique. Thank you so much. Uh, talking about uh, the practice in Rwanda, it's actually something that has been there for so long. So it's not something new in our culture and in our country. And this has actually meant to be something that parents, mainly women, they pass it to their daughters. And then actually uh, daughters can actually also discuss it amongst themselves. And it has a lot to do with the peer, like friends to friends discussion. And this is something that people has... Uh, said or has like uh, a reasoning or a myth that this is something that would help them in their lifetime as to being a fully of a woman. Mm. Uh, but there's a lot of scientific and cultural beliefs that I think this uh, discussion is going to help us to shed more light on each of those two points. Absolutely. And mm. usually uh, to add on what Magnifique has just said, uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a tradition and custom that goes from, the, from a generation to another. And uh, mostly um, it comes around uh, sexuality and uh, the peer pressure. Uh, if you, so a woman needs to do it to be considered as a full woman who is uh, now ready for marriage, who can be able now to satisfy uh, her man in bed. And uh, uh, currently it's still there. People are still doing it, uh, be uh, young girls or even women. And they, it brings pressure to, to women. Um, for those who have done it and also those who haven't done it. So... Yeah. Well, Dr. Magnifique says it's a myth. Mm -hmm. You say it brings pressure. But those that ascribe to it actually and practice it and going by the debate on social media, on right. our social media platforms, as you said, as mm -hmm. you saw rather, mm -hmm. they say that this is a culture that's, that increases both pleasure for partners during intimacy. But what do you say about this? Is it a myth or is it scientific? Does it have any scientific connotation around it? Uh, <laughs> I actually want uh, people to really, really understand this very well. When we talk about sexuality, sexuality is a purely a physiologic thing. It's something that, is, that goes with the brain. It's something that is, goes with the hormonal stimulation of our body. And then there's a lot of sensitive issue that goes up in our body to actually give someone pleasure. It's not a morphology thing. Most of the things. So when we talk about elongation, we're talking about stretching, you know, something that was there, like something that was normally formed, I mean, for believers, the way God actually provided it to be. Mm. So if you elongate it, it does not do anything to your hormonal changes that is in your body. It does not do anything to anyone. And again, remember, uh, the idea is to the man, not to the woman. Like, whoever who supports the idea of saying that this is something that is going to bring pleasure, it's not, they are not talking about the one who is doing it. Mm -hmm. They talk about this other person. So how that actually does to do uh, increased uh, pleasure, it's something that is not scientific. Mm. Again, uh, the only actually part that would explain that is that uh, pleasure, it's a subjective point of it. It's not something that you can quantify. It's not like a number that you can say uh, this is how much it's going to be increased. But it's something that would come with a uh, mindset. Mm. So if someone has believed that mm -hmm. this is something that is going to increase yeah. pleasure, it actually might be because that's what you want to feel. But it's not exactly where pleasure is. Because the way you would actually uh, see that in, in a way of a scientific, you'd consider does someone 
who has not mm -hmm. done it, if we, when you compare both of them, are they all having like sexual pleasure? So if that is there, then the idea of having the transformation, if I would call it a transformation, then it does not really, really give pleasure in that mm. sense. Because everyone can actually still have pleasure, whether you have had that or not. So Absolutely. that's exactly how I see it in a scientific reasoning. Very interesting. And as many have discussed that, as Juliet also said, that this practice has been on for a long time. Um, I, I'm not sure if all of us here have lived long enough to know the origin of this uh, practice. But mm -hmm. if you don't mind, uh, before we actually came on camera, he was telling us about the origin. What is the origin? Where did this whole thing come from? <laughs> right. So the origin of this, this is exactly a cultural thing. Mm. So we all know that before this development, like when the colonialism came, when people weren't like wearing clothes like we have today. So, and there were no pads, people were just like putting on uh, something to cover their uh, private parts. Mm. So, the older women knew very well, Randis were very smart enough to understand the physiologic changes that happens in a young lady. So, because we know that everyone who is in the reproductive age, they actually get menses every month. So, and menses, they are seen, or periods, the way everyone wants to call them, uh, they are seen as a private thing to a woman and something that you don't want to share with anyone. So they tried to create something that would help cover the private part. And once you have menses, you actually sense it before anyone else can know, before like blood can start shedding on your leg. And then you would know that you don't want to go in the public because they were only covering their private part. So anytime they have menses, it could actually just, you know, go everywhere anyone can see. Mm. So they created that. They started pulling to make sure that they can cover, you know, the private parts. So in any case, you start feeling a sense of like bleeding or something that is just touching you to f like with that kind of a sense because, you know, the human senses, we have the touch kind of sense. Mm. So when that is there, you feel like, hey, I'm going to go in my monthly period. So I need to hide from the public. And then women would have to hide like the whole time of the menses till like the three to five days to seven, depending on someone's cycle. So then you have to hide. Then once the cycle is done, then you can still cover yourself and then run away and go do every day's activities. But we're talking about that in the sense of no parts were there. No one was putting on anything. And they created that as a temporary, you know, a solution. But this is like, you know, the 21st century. Yeah. We not need that. To, we, need, we have parts. We have everything available for us, uh, for women especially, to do that. So they don't need to be subjected to something that actually has so much pain, irritations, that can subject them to infections. Mm. No, because there's a lot of facilities that can help us, can help anyone who wants that in these cases. So that was the easy. There was no point of pleasure by the time women, older women in our culture started doing this. There was no pleasure. The pleasure came out out of it when people were like, if you have done this, then you are a fully woman. Then people started attributing that to pleasure. Yeah. But initially, it wasn't pleasure. Juliet, you work mm -hmm. with girls and women in regards to sexual and reproductive health. Mm -hmm. And in your vast experience with them, what are the different, uh, with the different issues that they face, what would you say their perception or attitude is towards this practice? Um, uh, for the current women who are now... Um, let's say for uh, the current generation, uh, you'd find people who support the idea, but now currently it's more of like the sexuality, the sexual pleasure, because mm -hmm. now we have pad, as he said, we have menstrual cups, we have so many things that, uh, so many products that uh, can help us to, man to, to manage our, our, our periods. Mm -hmm. But now currently it's more of like bringing sexual pleasure and the woman who have elongated her labia is m in, our, in our culture, is considered as a full woman, someone who's, who can be married by anyone. We recently got comments, people who are commenting on, on this issue, and they said, ah, those girls will never get married, they will never find a man to marry them. But now, those that haven't you, practiced, haven't practiced mm. it. But now, uh, you will also find uh, another part of people who now uh, bring shame to those who have elongated their labia because they're like, why are you keeping this old culture, you know, we are we are experiencing so many cultures nowadays. You you are open to internet and information. You know what brings pleasure to your body. As he said, it's it's subjective. Like it's not something that you'd say it's general. What I feel during sex and what my friend feels during sex is totally different. Mm -hmm. So now. Um, 
when these girls now who have elongated their labia and they are in a society, let's say, the first time I saw it, it was in a, in a, in a boarding school. And we were sharing and I saw something that was totally stranger to me. And then I went and told my friends about it. They laughed at me because they, they thought that I knew. But the problem is now, currently, when you meet with people who have elongated their labia now, you they feel uncomfortable because they can't show they can't be they can't be free you know you can't go in a swimming pool because you don't know at what point it can come out you know yeah these are real stories of women who experience it every day now on these people now who haven't elongated and let's say in their family they, they're still praising the act when they're about to get married they are forced to do it uh this that are called uh express now that's why you hear women in in town who do it at a hundred thousand they they go and do it in a very private room you don't trust the hygiene of it you don't trust the product that they use so that you can be uh, presentable for marriage now think of this these are two people who have dated for two to three years let's say even a month they know each other some of them even have sex before marriage now you're forcing this lady because the so-called uh, family culture, uh, family tradition is for their women to go with their labia elongated. Now, this whole thing brings um, shame, it's uh, abuse, and and the bullying. You know, either for those who have elongated or those who haven't. Now, the issue for me now goes to the children. Okay. This is something that is introduced when you're about to go on your period, like the first time you go on your menstruation. Now, children are being sexualized. This is a child who needs to be protected, who needs to be protected from harm. And then you, you, you hear stories of mothers who, who will take you to your auntie and then they introduce you. To, they start, you know, you don't know as a child what they're doing to you. And you just see people pulling. It, it, it's painful. It, sometimes it brings swelling. Sometimes like, it, it's just a whole, the whole process is painful. Now, this is unacceptable to children because it's harmful. And as a society, we should condemn this. Either some, I've had stories of my friends who were introduced to it when they're in boarding school, especially, or in primary school when you're going in P4, P5, P6. And I think it's something that we need to talk about and we need as a society to stop it because it's not good if you are if you are an adult you are able, you are allowed to do whatever you want with your body but let's protect children from these harmful pr practices so definitely what i'm hearing is that some are pro mm -hmm. labia elongation mm -hmm. others are against it. Mm -hmm. but all those things are harmful to women because if you didn't do it, you are condemned by one part. If you did, if you do, if you did it, now you're also condemned by one part. But the aim is for you to please a man that you get married to, mm. and that is totally wrong. So I guess, mm. with an exception of children, mm -hmm. shouldn't women be let to do whatever they want if they see it fit that they mm -hmm. will they would want to do this mm -hmm. then? By all means, go ahead and do it. But then it shouldn't be mandatory by, by parents or by aunties. Or, that is what you're saying. Yes, but, but also that whole thing of why do women have to change their body or modify their body to please men? Why do we have to do it? Yeah. So, okay. Mm. Dr. Magnifique, yes. the other argument of this practice is that uh, it facilitates easier childbirth. What is the science <laughs> behind this? Uh, do the women who have engaged in, in this practice, do they have it easier than the rest? No, 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 no. Like when you talk about childbirth, there's nothing that the labia elongation would help. Would help. Uh, actually, people should understand. When we think about a baby being born, mm. we think mostly about three things. You know, we think about the baby, you know, it's, uh, imagine you're going to travel somewhere. So, because we are traveling from the uterus to the outside world. So you have uh, a passenger who is the baby who needs to come out. We have the passage, that's like the way that uh, you need to, but also you need to have a power to push you out from the uterus to outside. Mm. So there's nowhere, the, there's nowhere we see the labia playing a role. So it's not even in the passage. It does not go to the cervix, does not go to the vaginal canal, does not go to the, it's nothing through the, through the whole birth process. So, and whether you've have, you've have, you have had the process or not, you can have a cesarean section, you mm. can deliver normally. So it does not actually help in anything. 
okay. whatsoever to do with uh, delivery. Yeah. Juliet, HDI has been involved in advancing girls and, and, and women's rights and those of children, actually, especially on the issue of gender equality and, and promotion. And, and so in this context, how big do you think such social norms impact the life of a girl and a woman in general? Mm -hmm. So um, we all aim at ha having boys and girls being equal, men and women being equal. Mm. And in our law today, a man, uh, I would say a husband and a wife are all equal before the law. Mm. They are both heads of the family. Mm -hmm. Now, but when you go to the things that really contribute to, to, uh, to gender inequality, uh, social norms are part of it. And when you, now imagine you're telling a young boy and a young girl that they are equal before the law. But when you are in a private uh, setting, you're telling this lady to change her body so that she can please a partner. Now, you, in an indirect way, you're showing her that she is a second, um, I would say a second human being, or she comes, mm. uh, she comes next, you know. You have to change this. You have to, 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 to modify your body so that you can please your man. Now, you're not teaching these two people to be equal. You're, teach, you're actually putting them in their mind that you are not equal to your husband. Yes, our laws are, are really good, but we need to come to the root of the problems. And most of the time, social norms contribute a lot to the gender inequality. That's why, as we aim to go, um, as we aim to see the gender equality being uh, something real in our society, we need to go back to the root cause of all these things. So. I think, and, and as, as HDA, we think that so, we believe that social norms contribute a lot. So if they are, we need to change these, so, these bad social norms uh, to positive uh, norms that will, will encourage gender equality. So if you are equal before the law, let us also be equal in our family, in, our, in the society. Let the man and the woman be seen as equals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Dr. Magnifique, what are the pros, if any, of this practice and what are the cons of labia elongation? Uh, I personally would say that I don't have any pros for, for the act, but I believe in women's rights and choices for mm -hmm. whatever they want to do for their bodies. But there's something that I should actually say. If you want to elongate your labias, I want you to be informed. Mm -hmm. Me, as a scientist, as a doctor, I want you to be informed about the act. So I want you to be informed that this is nothing to actually increase your pleasure. You might want to believe it is, but it's not proven scientifically. Mm. So I want you to know that uh, you cannot do this for someone who cannot consent. So if someone is below 18 in, in our country, they shouldn't be subjected to this because they are not at the level of consenting. So I would say that if after all, after you know everything and then you still choose to do it, I mean, for me, I'd like, okay, it's as if someone is going to do something. I mean, they want to do. But honestly, I wouldn't see uh, the, why they should do it on the pro side. So the cons, I, it has some complications. has some complications while doing the act. First, okay. yeah, first, like you are going to do this when with, it's actually a hand manipulation. So they use... Uh, when you read different articles that has been published on this, they will tell you they use some herbal medicine. So they try to use those to stretch uh, the skin because the labia we're talking about is a skin. So uh, when, once they do that, for some people, the stretchability of our skin is different. For some people, they have a smoother, I mean, skin that would be able to, to be stretched, and the others is a little bit harder to, to do it. Mm. So that actually goes... Once you're trying to apply so much pressure on the skin, so it's irritated so much, you can actually injure the skin and cause some wounds around there. And then once you do that, you create a port of entry for infections, and then someone will be dealing with infections. And because it's actually on a, on a sensitive area, the infection could be ascending, you know? Mm. And then we know from uh, uh, very much uh, medicine that for some people with uh, chronic infections, it's actually one of the causes of infertility. Mm. So people should just really? like know that. Uh, so from the con side of it, we've got a lot. You know, there's that pain that you need to subject to people, those irritations, uh, and that risk for infections. So if people, uh, they know all that and they still want to do it, 
I'm, I'm okay with that. But I want you to be informed and please like, not to do it for someone who is not able to consent. Mm. Yeah. May I ask just, just a small clarification. How, how does it pose a risk for infertility? Uh, the, in, the risk for infertility is, comes from infection part of it. Mm. Yeah, it means like if you have infections that are ascending, they go to your tubes. You know, like we have, women have like fallopian tubes. Yeah. Uh, and then the tubes can actually uh, dilate. Uh, what we call hydrosalpanks in that case. So it can be filled with water, if I would call it water, some fluid. So in that case, the egg cannot travel from the tube because the fertilization happens in the tube and yeah. then has to travel to the uterus. So that would uh, impact the movement of the ovum to go to the, to the, to the, to the fertilizer, I mean, to be implanted in the uterus. So that's some rare, some very rare, but it can happen. Mm -hmm. But imagine at what cost you want to put yourself at, you know, risking something that can affect your fertility just because you wanted to do something that is not really, really uh, helping that much. Mm. So it comes from infection, then infection can cause that. Absolutely. Mm. And Juliette, uh, maybe this will go to both of you. This culture is viewed as an act of socialization mm -hmm. that helps Rwandan women identify with their uh, culture heritage as per that some of the documents and papers that mm -hmm. I read. But now, I don't suppose you share the same view as, <laughs> as there's so many people on social media. What's your take on this, both of you? Uh, in terms of it being um, helping women identify with their cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that culture evolves. And um, since we, we've changed so many culture, uh, our tradition and uh, norms that mm -hmm. we believed before that they were very useful, and uh, today we no longer do it. We no longer do them. Before we used to share uh, together and drink from one cup, mm. but today we are no longer doing that. And it was really meaningful. It was a sign of socialization. Mm. So uh, for those who still believe that, I believe that th they don't have available information as Dr. Magnifique has just shared. And I believe that if they are able to understand what it really means, mm. we, could ha we could see a shift. Because it's happening already. We... Uh, you, you'll hear so many young people who no longer believe in this, and I believe that the ones who will carry uh, the next generation, uh, the, the light to all our culture, uh, to the next generation. Mm -hmm. And if we could see that changing even in other parts of the country, we see women understanding what this practice really means and why it even started, because there are so many myths about it when it comes to sexual pleasure that... Uh, there are so many myths, uh, you know, and uh, I believe if there is enough information, people will understand that it's harmful and there is no need for it to be there because even women who have never elongated their labia also experience sexual pleasure. Mm. So it's a matter of uh, time and us understanding how harmful it is to women and girls. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Your take? Yeah, I think we're not taking it from our culture because yeah. it's already it's something has happened, you know, and... I think we're good just keeping it in the history and write it and know that it has existed. But I think uh, for but the way... some argue culture is part of life. It is, but it is. But I'm saying that if we keep it, if we keep doing it, we might risk something that we don't want to risk. So I want people, as I said before, let's get informed as much as we can. You know, our information is available for everyone. Mm. And then we can we can use the information to make better choices. Mm. And again, as my colleague, my colleague has just said, there's a lot that we have actually evolved about when it comes to culture. I remember growing up, we used to dance like the traditional dances, you know, barefoot. But now you cannot stand in front of anyone dancing without putting on your shoes. That is something that we see in our culture. It has existed for so many years, but we are like, no, we need hygiene and we need protection. So I also think that in the same you know, same way of evolving, I think this is also somewhere people should actually start thinking about Absolutely. Probably living it. Yeah, uh, based on this discussion and this debate, so far the biggest motivation I'm hearing is that most of the women do it for, for the sake of the pleasuring the, their partner. But perhaps then we need to uh, create more awareness for the men to actually not go into marriage thinking that if my partner does not do this, then it's over, like we can't mm -hmm. do it. So what can be done in regards to um, 
educating or making awareness for mm -hmm. the men to know that this is actually, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be a prerequisite for marriage. Mm -hmm. mm, I believe that we need more awareness uh, on, on this subject, uh, being able to discuss, um, asking the young girls how they feel about the whole act, the whole practice, mm. you know, hearing from them, at least we'll get to understand how painful it is and how and harmful, and also getting to hear from, from boys and men uh, about their, their, their perspective uh, about it, and uh, we, we really need to take it as a, as a society to understand that this is really harmful and uh, also to as HDI is doing with this first, uh, I would say, first show, mm. we with uh, on awareness on 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 this uh, on this practice, we need more of this talk in Kenya, Rwanda, especially getting yeah. to hear from young girls, getting to hear from uh, uh, women, all the women, and then we come to we get to understand that now this is this is something that we need to change as a society, mm. and also protecting girls in in in, in schools if. Uh, um, usually have like m uh, matrons at uh, yeah. in bonding school, mm -hmm. so having like program with them uh, so that they can be aware that if these things is happening in schools, they need to be aware and stop it. I've had stories of so many schools in Rwanda where the, um, like nuns, uh, these schools of. Um, Catholic, uh, mm. some, some of them, some, some nuns will hear about those stories and discourage it completely. So it's a good thing because it used to, like the way they're irritating the, 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 the labia and all this, but it, it irritates and it creates a, 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 I would say, a discomfort in the body. So um, I, would, I, would, I would say that we need more awareness and information available to everyone. Mm. Mm. What's your yeah, uh, when we think about uh, this, I was thinking that we've, we've seen so many uh, progress, mm. like for, for the he for she campaigns, mm. like for the campaigns where we want to involve men, like there are so many campaigns where men actually should stand mm. out for women. So I think this is one of the, uh, one of those that we could actually champion as men, because mm. why should a man put a pressure for a woman that before I wed you, you'd have to do the practice. So for me, I feel like as a man, you don't want to have your woman go through all this. And for the purpose of your pleasure. And when you know, actually, that you can still have pleasure without it. Mm. So I feel like men should actually stand out and be able to share this publicly and tell women that, hey, I don't want you to do this. And actually, uh, there are so many men that I actually personally have actually spoke to. And they say that, I wouldn't really, really want someone to elongate their labias. So imagine if somewhere someone is actually trying to elongate their labia, when there's this other man who, like, no, actually enjoys someone, you know, without that. So there's a lot of discrepancies. So I feel like we need to stand out as men to say, hey, it's not a prerequisite. It's none of what actually I want in, in a marriage. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there's been also a lot of debate about whether this practice of labia elongation is a form of female genital mutilation. Mm. But a few studies actually based here in Rwanda, uh, they have concluded that it's rather modification mm. instead of uh, mutilation. First of all, what's the difference between modification and mutilation? And what's your take on whether this is FGM or not? Uh, definitely from so many studies and virtual recommendations, uh, it has classified this in modification, not in uh, mutilation. Mm. So mutilation, there's a sense of excision and incision. Mm. That's mostly the argument that people uh, put up with that, that the mutilation would involve something like you excise, there's a procedure excising or incising any part of the female. Uh, and they want to put this in, in the modification because it's more of morphological modification yeah. of the female uh, reproductive uh, parts. Mm. So then, um, my take about it, uh, well, I agree with whatever the scientific uh, approach has talked about, mm. but this, if actually the trend, if actually the trend would actually go the way it is, I wouldn't say that in the near future we would find it being a mutilation. Because mm. if you're doing this for a seven-year-old, Mm -hmm. who, who cannot consent, who cannot, who doesn't even know what it is, you know, who can't even understand. Mm. So I think 
at some point it actually carries the weight of a mutilation. Mm. But if this is something that someone is doing like 20 year old, 18 or whoever, older person who is able to consent, to understand the risk and who bears the, you know, the risk of it, then it's program modification. So I think the definition could actually vary depending on who's, who, who, the way you're actually trying to look at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Juliet, is it mutilation or modification? Uh, it, 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 it was there before, but it was removed. We need to go back and know why it was removed. As he said, it's really harmful to young girls. So uh, if the conversation starts, uh, like we bring back the conversation, mm. we could see it back maybe in the, in the WHO uh, and the f female uh, genital mutilation. So let's, let's see, let's keep le le uh, their, their research, uh, let's see if they be uh, more research on it, getting to hear from uh, from the girls and hear their stories, how how painful it was to f for them, and then we keep the conversation. I would love to hear this conversation going in other countries that we share the same uh, the same uh, culture with, so so that we hear from them as well. Because when we have a bigger voice, then it's able to to go out there, and then we will see even laws coming in in different countries where this practice is totally uh, uh, removed and we also have like uh, punishments to whoever is practicing, is practicing this to, to young girls. So let's bring back the conversation and see how it goes because it's really important to bring it back. Mm. Yeah. But it's also evident that some people have no issue with this practice. But on the other hand, a lot of girls, like you have said, a lot of girls say they've been influenced by social pressure uh, by either their peers or adults, such as their parents. Mm. Because like when a moment, uh, the moment a girl reaches puberty, then they're told, "Aha, uh -huh, it's time for you to actually do this. So <laughs> what, what, should be, what should be done to allow girls and women to decide whether they want to do this or not? Uh, Considering... Mm -hmm. There are those that do it and be like, I'm, I'm happy with it, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. uh, like he said, based on, the, on, an, on an informed uh, mm -hmm. decision. And then there are those that do it just out of pressure. So, so what's, what's, what's the, the motive? balance? What's yeah. the motive behind, mm -hmm. behind it? Now, as Magnifique said, it's, when it started, it's for, it was to cover the body and, uh, and allow a girl to, to hide uh, her period. But now it's more of, like, of, of sexual pleasure than it was before. Now we have buds. Now we need to question the, the motive because that's how uh, the patriarchy system uh, is built because the motivation will be for you to enjoy sex. It will be for you to, so that your man would be pleased for you to get a partner. Mm -hmm. Now we need to question the motivations. And whoever choosing to do it needs to also question the motivation. Why am I changing my body? And though in the, in the documentary that the Dr. Minifik participated in in BBC, he said that it's not reversible. Now imagine you've, you've, you've elongated your labia. Now you get to the point where you divorce with this person or you, the, your partner dies and you want, to re, you want to go back to how you were. And it's impossible. Now, you, you need to really question the motives and understand, uh, and understand the consequences of whatever you, 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 you're doing. So uh, this, is, this is for adults, you know. But for, for girls, I will always say it's really harmful and we need to stop it. Mm. Yeah. How do we strike a balance between culture and science? <laughs> so this is again what I said before. I feel like uh, if someone is informed and they are at the level of making their own choices, well, it's, for, for now it's not against the law, at least as I might say, so it's your choice to do it. But again, mm. let's stretch about the motivation, you know. Do something that you know you're not going to reverse it, you know. The day you want to go back to, way, to the way you are. I mean, I see people with tattoos, you know. Someone puts on a tattoo because they broke up with someone. And then you try, you, you actually, after two weeks, you're like, you settled and you're like, and you had something that was trashing the guy. Now you want to change it. You cannot take it back, you know? And you're like, I need to live with this. Why would you want to do something that at some point, you don't know, you mm -hmm. want to go back? So mm -hmm. I feel like we try as much as we do to provide information. And this is what HDI is doing very good. Mm -hmm. So then after, if people still choose us to go in that sense, I would say sorry, but again, I feel like you actually shouldn't go there. And there's a lot, actually. There's a lot about um, the psychological part of it. Mm -hmm. The psychological part of it comes in here. When someone doesn't want it, 
but the whole group around the person wants you to have the, the procedure, the practice. So once you go into the practice without your mind being at it, mm -hmm. just because you are pushed by the people, mm -hmm. then it can actually cause people's uh, problem. You know, we talk about mental health every day. You know, but we don't realize how much something like this would actually put someone in a crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, they feel isolated. They don't feel belonging to a society. They feel like, hey, I don't want to do this, but everyone around me, including my parents, including my mom, including everyone, mm -hmm. wants me to do this. Then, you know, you find someone is actually being in depression mm -hmm. just because of something they are trying to be dragged into and mm -hmm. which does not really have benefits that we could, you know, talk about. Absolutely. Let's take this conversation to some of your comments on social media. The cup guy says it's important to hear from women that still value this practice and understand why they do it and the motives behind it, just like uh, some of you had discussed. And then someone called Ubozima on Twitter says no need for scientific proof. My only concern is that it's done to minors without considering their wishes. They used to say that it's only possible to elongate labia before your menstruation, but I think that was a trick for adults to impose it to girls when they were still uh, too young to decide. Uh, someone else in Sanga, Sil Sylvie, says labia elongation is a form of female genital mutilation and we are babysitting this practice in the Rwandan society in the name of men pleasure. It's child abuse concern since we are doing it to kids who can't consent. Uh, so many of other topics, rather comments that we'll get back to uh, slightly. But uh, I think, what do you think so far of these uh, the, the comments that have been given? Yeah, about it's, so, it's so good to hear from uh, these people. Now you understand that this this is a battle that we all have to to fight. And um, the good thing is to hear all these good comments. I'll, I'll say, like, uh, it's, we are really against it when it comes to the girl child, they are not supposed to, 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 to face this kind of, uh, of, of harmful, um, harmful practices. Mm. So uh, let, let's all, um, as we, we all uh, want to end teenage pregnancy, it's a topic that is being discussed by so many. Let mm. this topic also come. Let's not uh, shy away from it. Mm. Let's understand that, that it's, it's, it's everyone's responsibility to protect the girl child. Mm. Yes. Mm. Uh, someone else says, I don't think it's it's bad if you do it to attract your man, just like wearing uh, waist beads or sexy lingerie. Wow. So it should sexy be... Sexy lingerie <laughs> and braids? Well, yeah, beads, waist yes, beads. Yeah. 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 Can, those ones you can buy and put them somewhere, but this is something that someone is going to live with for the rest of their lives. Mm. You're modifying your body for someone else. So it's it's really not something that we should encourage. Absolutely. So many people here say they stand with science. Uh, you're shaking the table so much. And please, other people basically are pro, um, are pro the practice mm -hmm. and others are against the practice. Most of them definitely saying do what you want as long as it yeah. does not cause mm -hmm. any, um, any discomfort to you. So is there research, back to you, Dr. Magnific, is there research that has been conducted to ascertain the risks that are associated with uh, labia elongation? Uh, well, there's so many research that actually has happened. As I said before, um, the, 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 this is a subjective point of it. So a subjective thing, the way you research about it, you do it in a form of a qualitative research. A qualitative research, you're talking about attitudes, perception, how mm. people feel, you know? Uh, so the, the so many uh, side effects, if I would put it that way, people has actually mentioned this is what we mentioned before. Pain was mentioned in so many articles. Uh, irritation was mentioned. Infection was mentioned. Um, so those are the things that people have uh, seen. And I've actually uh, seen one of the research that was conducted in, uh, in the northern uh, province. And again, this was uh, they interviewed 13 women that have carried out the, the procedure, mm -hmm. and. The way they refer to it, the answer is that the men, our men would say they enjoy sex with, because we've done this, you know. But again, how does uh, someone actually quantify the enjoyment they have got from, uh, you know, their partners? It's something that's 100% subjective. So there's definitely the, the, the complications of the procedure. Uh, but again, uh, 
Again, the, the research is something that is improving. Probably more research is actually going to be conducted about it. Mm. But from what we can just see from an observation point of it, you just see that this is something that's there and the complications are there. And whether you want, we accept or we don't accept, mm. they're still there. Mm -hmm. Well, some women regard these practices, some of these practices, including labia elongation, as a force in their lives, a positive force in their lives, while others may regard it as a negative force uh, since... Sexual pleasure, like he has said, is a matter of um, mutual interest and enjoying of specific sexual behaviors. What's your take on this, both of you? Is it a positive force? Is it a negative force? Uh, it's a negative force because at the end of the day, when you look at the motives, we should really question the motive behind this as a woman. Cause, and, and we could also... Um, feel of uh, like we are, we are so big in our culture that we are the only people who enjoy sex in this world and it's not true there are so many people from other cultures who enjoy sex in their own way so uh, I believe that it's just um, a matter of being not being informed mm. and I believe as a woman or as a man you need to be really informed about what makes you happy yeah, as he said these women were saying how it makes their men happy but we need to get to a point where we need to teach girls and women to understand their body, to know what makes them happy, to, to understand how, how, how they experience sexual pleasure. So the problem is because women are always taken as people who give, you know, so you're not, you're not also receiving, but you need to question that. How do I receive it? Being married or not, but you need to understand how your body functions, what makes you happy. And, as, and when you know that now you will you will question whatever you're doing so if you're okay um elongating your labia for sexual pleasure and you understand and you you have all available information what would we do it's your choice as a woman because we need we, we need to allow women to also decide on what makes them happy but you also need to understand why you're doing that mm. Mm. yeah for me if we want to make it a positive force i'd say we need to medicalize it I would say that, okay, if it is a positive force, then let's put it in a medical field. Let's get a place where it is, it should, this should be done. Let's have well, people that are trained to do this in a proper way, minimize pain, minimize all the complications. And, well, once you've chosen to do it, then go and do it. But for me, I would say it's still negative. Why? Because this is still being done to minors. Second, this is being done for not really, really good motivations, as she said, because people are still motivated by their peers, by their families. And, uh, well, for the pleasure part, if someone really, really believes this should be done out of pleasure and they consent and they have the age of consent, let, the, let, let us know exactly that this is a place that they can do it. Mm -hmm. And anyone knows that this is a safe place that you can send someone to do it, you know? Not like in those hidden houses when you don't actually know the practice and then this can actually be seen mm. and investigated and you know be looked at in all the senses all mm. the corners so in that in that sense i would take it as a positive force but if it's something that is still being done you know in those hidden places it has <laughs> a negative force to me Juliet, what's your take on medicalizing the entire practice will it still be <laughs> a, a bad practice even after they modify the way they do it mm. if it ever comes to that anyway yeah uh, okay for for those women who really who, who who feel like this is good for them and they've decided they have available information about it it's really good to have a place where it's safe and uh, clean um, as you go to, to do a tattoo and you know we have places they're registered, let them register and let, them, let, uh, let everybody know that it's, uh, it's somewhere where someone can go and, uh, and make a, modif a modification on their body. But uh, at the end of the day, I would still con continue to question the motive. If it's something that you know <laughs> that it, it will bring pleasure to you, then well and good. You know, but if you if you're doing that to to please uh, a partner who may change the next day and then no longer into you, and then you get another partner who doesn't also want uh, someone who has elongated their labia now, it, that all thing bring confusion to women, and and I believe that it's something that women are always. Um, 
always leave uh, you leave for somebody else and and i don't think that's that's right if we are really looking at gender equality let us let all be, let everything be equal if it's in the family setting if it's at work if it's in the law let 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 us preach what we let us live what we preach mm. you can't tell a woman that she's equal to her to to, to 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 her husband but when it comes at home she she now has to do different things to change herself to 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 to, to to currently like uh, denying herself, making yourself someone else. Now imagine the next day if he's no longer into uh, someone who has elongated their labia and they want you to cut it. Are you going to the surgery? And you know, so it's, it's all, it will come back to the motivation of the practice because we believe that se sexual pleasure is subjective. So now you need to know as a woman what makes you happy and go with it and find a partner who matches your energy. Totally. Yes. As we wind up, perhaps <laughs> what's, uh, what's in the pipeline for such information to be disseminated mm -hmm. to even uh, what I would call the audiences that really need this information because I believe this is just a fraction of the people watching mm -hmm. us and following us mm -hmm. uh, as HDI, as yeah. a gynecologist, mm -hmm. as a doctor, mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what is in place mm -hmm. for such information? We are planning to do more programs on uh, raising more awareness on radio shows, discussing with women if need be even a research to really understand uh, this, this issue. Mm -hmm. So uh, th there will be more programs about uh, this topic and we, we, we are inviting so many people I, I we don't mind people who, who 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 support it we need to understand why they're supporting it mm. and people who are also against the, the the practice we also need to understand we also want them to come on board and let us discuss about this uh this this issue but uh as we go along we'd like to to, to tell people that it's really harmful to young girls. So if you want to do it, you can do it when you're above 18. Mm. But let girls be protected. Let them live their freedom. Let them not be um, uh, corrupted in their mind. Imagine today you're... <laughs> I was about to say a, a word in French, tripoté, uh, in, 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 the, in the girl's uh, private part. And the next day, you're telling this girl not to have sex. Like, you're, you're confusing the child. Let the child be, let the child grow, and when they will be older enough, they will decide what they want. Mm. So uh, let's really protect the girls and stop this practice. And as a society, let's discourage it. Absolutely. Mm. Dr. Magnifique, what is your role as a medical doctor or even as all health mm -hmm. health workers across in, in determining whether the effects of, of, of this practice to women's health. Mm. So uh, my take about this is that I agree to I agree with her that we need to have a conversation around this topic and mainly now we need to have uh, more people on the table that are supportive and let's discuss about this in an open discussion and try to understand what is the motive behind this. Uh, I believe uh, that if people are informed and they really know the consequences and they mm. understand the magnitude of the consequences, some of actually most of the people would actually say no to this. And uh, I believe from the scientific uh, part of it, people should understand and should actually ask. We need to tell the people mostly uh, those sort of myths around the, the practice. And then when people are able to decide as, as she said, and I agree with her, then they can either choose to do it or not. But as of now, as in this conversation, even like talked about rights, I think now on people should understand that doing the practice to a young uh, woman, this is, this is uh, actually against their rights. As uh, It's a child abuse form of it, actually. Because mm. in the recent, if, for the GBV, for example, when you're teaching uh, young, uh, young people about GVP, we tell them, with GVP, we tell them that if someone try to touch your private part, report them. So actually, in, in the other sense, we, need to tell, we are telling them that even if someone tries to do anything, any form of touch, it's already an abuse. Report them. So it's, it's something against the, if I come to any school and I tell them this information and they go back home, they are, someone starts doing the act, then it's, it's really not, not a thing. Think. So I think we need to... We need to, to, to look at it. And again, I think we need to come back to the conversation of, is this really just a modification or a, a, a mutilation? Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. we need to really go deep in the discussion and find out, you know, mm -hmm. 
because I feel like if it's a mutilation, I'm against medicalization. Mm. But if people want to call it modification, it comes as like a plastics thing, you know? Mm. Now we know that people are changing themselves the way they Absolutely, want. So yeah. if then you want to mod call it modification, let's make it in a way that is nicer, well prepared, and min minimize the risks. If then it's mutilation, let's mm. say it's, it's not. Absolutely. Well, and time, unfortunately, our time is fast spent, but what a really insightful conversation. Thank you, Dr. Magnifique. Thank you, Juliette. Thank you. Thank you for all our viewers that followed us. Uh, keep the conversation going. Is it mutilation, modification? Is it a myth? Is it scientific? Well, I hope we can find some answers. But otherwise, thank you so much for following us, and thank you to my guests for making the time today. Thank you so much. Bye for now.